All right, everyone, good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and make a start. We are still waiting for a couple of people to join us, but um, I know uh, if it's anything like last time that they tend to come out in the first couple of minutes. So first of all, welcome to session four. We are now about halfway through the online course. We have four more sessions to go. This afternoon, I do want to um, welcome everyone back to the course. We do have apologies this afternoon from Barbara Karalesson and Nilu and Jane, uh, so we know in advance that they will not be joining us. Uh, this afternoon, we have Karen and Richard and Stephanie and Mary and Amanda and Julia and Charlene so far. And good afternoon to all of you and good evening to Stephanie and Charlene. Uh, now that our time has changed, the time difference for our Doha colleagues is three hours, so they're definitely in early evening by now. We're still waiting for um, Denise and Kate to join us, and with any luck, they will join us before we start our discussion activities. Just as in the previous sessions, we're gonna be using a combination of GoToMeeting and Skype, so I'm hoping that all of you, again, have a second Skype-enabled device that you're able to use when we do the paired discussion parts of our discussion. Um, and the paired discussions right now, we may adjust these slightly, um, but we plan for Stephanie and Julia, uh, someone with Mary, if we don't, if we end up with an odd number of people, um, Mary Latifa and I will Skype with you, Charlene and Richard, Karen and Denise, and Kate and Amanda. And of course the exact pairings will depend on um, whether or not our last two colleagues are able to join us this afternoon. So we'll update that this list just prior to starting those paired discussions. Before we get started today, does anyone have any questions? And again, what we'd like you to do is simply type an asterisk into the chat box and we will open your microphone to take your question. So any questions before we get started today? I don't see anyone asking a question right now, but again, as we go through the session today, um, please, if you have anything to say, if you want to ask a question, type an asterisk into the box at any time. Oh, Kate is here and just logging in. So, okay, Kate, uh, thank you very much. So we're just waiting for Denise now. All right. So this week's materials were designed, oh, I'm sorry. As, as a reminder, in just a moment, we will be turning off all the webcams and muting all the microphones, and we will turn those on and off as we need to um, as you respond. And as Latifa has explained before, this helps conserve the bandwidth and it makes it move just a little bit faster, and it also prevents any feedback uh, that you might get if we had all of the microphones open at the same time. So again, we, when you are actually speaking, you will need to turn your microphone on, and we will unmute your microphone here, and then we will be able to hear you. This week's materials were designed to help you think about the instructional methods and materials that you might use in your lesson study. And in preparation for today's session, we did ask you to um, watch a short video and to read uh, a printed piece about um, differentiation. And just as in the other sessions, we're gonna present just a short video summarizing the content for this week. And again, I know that the video does move very quickly. We do record the session and the video is one of the things that you can go back easily and watch a second time if you'd like to. Hello, and welcome to the fourth of eight sessions designed to help you build the knowledge, understanding, and skills you will need to engage in lesson study. I'm Ben Wren, the head of the Center for Inspiring Minds. This short video will introduce you to a range of established and emerging models, concepts, and practices that involve the collection, analysis, and use of student data to inform instructional methods, material choice, and differentiation. Like most professional inquiry aimed at improving teaching and learning, lesson study begins by collecting and analyzing relevant student data. This data may take many forms, and the types of data available will change as the school year progresses. At the start of the school year, assessment data from the previous year, standardized academic test results, and narrative report comments from previous teachers provide a range of baseline information. 
Depending on the nature of your professional inquiry, this assessment data may need to be supplemented with start of year academic assessments and student surveys or interviews. Data triangulation is the collection of data about a specific learning outcome from two or more valid and reliable assessments. Data triangulation helps ensure that learning targets are not based on a single assessment, which could have been influenced by a range of factors that affect reliability, including illness or other socio-emotional factors. ACS International Schools defines assessment as an ongoing process of gathering, analyzing, reflecting on, and communicating evidence of learning. Although currently an aspirational practice, data-driven instruction is currently the focus of many teachers' professional growth activities. Data-driven instruction involves the use of past assessment data to set challenging individual learning goals and collect and communicate evidence of learner progress. Key to learner progress is the identification and use of instructional methods and materials that challenge students within their individual learning zones, their zones of proximal development. Differentiation is a familiar professional practice and one that relies on rich formative assessment of learner progress against specific learner outcomes or standards. Although teachers can design learning experiences with individual students in mind, they do not typically have the capacity to observe the individual learning arising from these differentiated instructional methods. This is an area where lesson study can offer unique contributions to our understanding of effective teaching and learning. A distinguishing feature of lesson study is its focus on learning rather than teaching. Its use of focal observations enables teachers to gain important insight into the effectiveness of their instructional methods at the individual level. These in-depth focal student observations provide formative assessment information that drives future instruction and helps ensure successful learner outcomes. Lesson study data can help teachers understand how and if students are using prior knowledge. Lesson study data can help teachers understand which elements of an instructional method supported student learning and which served as barriers. Lesson study data can help teachers understand how students' knowledge and understanding of the topic changed over the course of a lesson or unit. And lesson study data can provide invaluable information about non-cognitive skills and dispositions, such as organization, persistence, and collaboration. While traditional assessment methods provide information on what to improve, lesson study provides information on how to improve. It doesn't just target academic development, it also scrutinizes other factors that contribute to students' long-term learning success. In the next session, we will be bringing together your learning from the first four sessions as we discuss planning the research lesson. Thank you for your continued interest in lesson study. All right, again, I'll ask if anyone has any questions. If you do, can you please type an asterisk into the box? And it could be a question or a comment if you just like to share something at this point. Amanda, we're opening your microphone. If you want to also unmute yourself. Okay. Go ahead, Amanda. Okay. I, I was just curious. Um, in the in this the session guide there uh, were two reading um, assignments and the first one uh, when I clicked on the link it was like you know just symbol characters so I was able to find that one online um, just by searching the title but the second one I wasn't able to find um, by searching the title and, it, and the link was the same it didn't actually link to a, a document that I could read did anyone else have that problem or did I just wait too long or? No, Amanda, some other people did have that problem. I'm not certain why that happened. When we put the links in, we tested the links afterward and they, they worked on our browsers. It could be a browser function sometimes. Okay. And I don't know how else to, to try to explain that. But I, whenever yeah, you... I, I opened it on Chrome. It wouldn't open on Chrome or Firefox, but it worked on Safari. So I think it's a browser issue. Okay. Yep. So the first thing I would try, okay. if you okay. the problem again... Uh, so I should just... Yeah, the, I the guess first... I was just trying to get access to that second document. So if anyone has the PDF, if it could be sent, that would be great. Yeah. So, so whenever you encounter that problem with the documents, 
um, please do get, go ahead and try a second browser. If the second browser doesn't work, please let me know because I also have PDFs of all the documents. I'm happy to send them to you. The reason that I link you initially with the PDF is to avoid any copyright issues, but it's no issue for me to send a single copy for someone to use in, in a one-off piece. I just can't send it. I can't broadcast it to everyone as part of the course. So again, that's why we're using the links instead of sending PDFs. But please know that I always have all the materials. I can send you films or PDFs anything that you can't access successfully on your own. Amanda, thanks for that. It was a good technical question because we did have other people who did encounter that problem. All right, it also looks like Denise has now joined us and is Kate? Yeah, Kate, um, is that, um, Julia. Julia, um, could you just confirm? Um, is it? Yeah. Sorry. It's Kate here as well. Okay, thank you. It's Kate here as well. I was using Julia to say I can't talk anyone and I can't join Citrix either. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're sharing with Julia. That's fine. Okay. Ah. Okay. All right. So, so I want to go through the pairings for today, and this is going to be challenging a little bit challenging because I'm going to need to change these so um, I'm going to have Stephanie and Julia and Kate since Julia and Kate are in the same space and they can share the Skype call um, and then we can have Mary and Denise so Mary and Denise Charlene and Richard oh, no, just, no, just Mary and Amanda and then these stay the same Oh, yes, yes. So Stephanie, Stephanie, Julia, and Kate, Mary and Amanda, Charlene and Richard, Karen and Denise. Let me do that one more time. Stephanie, Julia, and Kate, Mary and Amanda, Charlene and Richard, and Karen and Denise. All right, we're going to go on then to our first pair discussion and to prepare for the paired discussion, you're gonna need Learning Log 4.1. And 4.1 was, again, it was a reflection on the video and the reading, and it was a Connect Extend challenge um, question. And so in your paired discussions, I would like you to consider these three questions. So how do the practices or ideas connect to your prior knowledge and practice? How do the practices and ideas extend your thinking or practice? And how do these practices or ideas challenge your thinking or practice? We're going to give you 15 minutes for your discussion. We'll let you know when there are two minutes left. When we all come back together, we're gonna to ask people to volunteer to share some of the things that you talked about. So again, if you want to go ahead and begin your Skype conversations, if you have any questions as you go through your conversation, please just type the asterisk into the chat box and we will call on you. If not, we will see you again in 15 minutes. And again, we'll let you know when there are two minutes left. Thank you. Okay, okay we're back. Change this one. Welcome back, everybody. What I would like to do now is to take the questions one at a time and ask you to volunteer to share what you talked about during your paired discussion. So the first question that we want to look at is how do these practices or ideas connect to your prior knowledge and practice? And again, if you could use the asterisk to raise your hand and we will open your mic and ask you to unmute your mic and listen to your response. Again, we're looking for people just to give us some feedback or tell us what you talked about with this first question. How do these practices or ideas connect to your prior knowledge and practice? And we're opening Karen's mic. Okay, Karen, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Denise and I talked about um, how many of these are practices that we use at, at times. Um, and some of them are practices that we've identified as things that we, we want to use more. Um, but um, generally, the, I mean, the, in both in the video and the article, you know, we saw them develop to a depth greater than um, the way that we've been using them. 
Great. Thank you for that. Would anyone else, else like to share what they talked about in their paired discussion? All right, we're going to move on to the second question. And again, ask you to share a little bit about what you talked about in your paired discussion with the second question. How do these practices or ideas extend your thinking or practice? We just had Karen talk about the fact that she recognized a lot of these practices and that they are things that some of the things that we're using, some of the things we want to use, but recognizing that there are kind of more developed ways to approach them, kind of more holistic ways to approach them. So again, this question is, how do these practices extend your thinking or practice? Again, if you'll just type the asterisk into the chat box and we will open your microphone. Thank you, Amanda. We're opening your microphone. If you want to go ahead, please, and unmute yourself. Amanda, go ahead, please. Um, just building on one of the things that struck me in the video in particular was that that um, to open sort of a wider perspective of data, the data that we use. I know as a teacher, um, I'm using lots of different types of data, but not necessarily when we have data meetings do we look at data with such a wide lens um, or, you know, to gather together to assess student work to that degree. And I think that that actually would be really helpful. Great. Amanda, thank you for that. Again, one of the interesting things about lesson study is that lesson study is something that can drive a practice like uh, data informed instruction, or it can complement or supplement things that are happening already. And so again, in thinking about how these things extend your practice, um, we're thinking more about how they actually build on the things we're already doing, or as I said, may actually be influencing or introducing new aspects of practice. Would anyone else like to respond to that one? Okay, we're going to move on to the third question, which is how do these practices or ideas challenge your thinking or practice? What new questions do they open up for you as a teacher when you look at things like uh, evidence-informed instruction or uh, Combining that with differentiation, what are the new questions or challenges does it present for you? And again, if you will type an asterisk into the box and we will open your microphone. Denise, thank you. We are opening your microphone. If you would like to unmute yourself, please. Go ahead, Denise. One of the things that I thought, and obviously it requires administration and departments and divisions and everybody to be involved in this, is, I mean, one thing I, I new questions I had was, were how it would look like if we allotted the time to actually sit down, look at data, spend time, like that school they were show, showing in the video, spend time, um, with assessment, pairing it with um, standards, then spending time actually analyzing. And although I'm trying to do a mini example of that in the project and looking at data from the students, seeing how I can apply it to lessons, um, it would be, you know, it, it brings up a lot of questions of how, how departments and curriculum would look like if we allotted more time for this. Because the examples in the differentiation article were amazing in being able to, you know, have the three groups and be able to do, um, have the students really decide the pace that they would like to follow and 
how much of it they would like to do a lot of it on their own um, and it would be wonderful to have every lesson do that but for that you sort of need support not only from maybe colleagues that are teaching the same level but to have the time to dedicate to that um, and as we all know that's the that's the hardest part I think <laughs> yep. Denise, thank you for that. I, I think that, that with all things like this, that the, the question about how we use our time and how we prioritize our time and the extent to which we change the way that we use our time to use our time to address things that possibly will have uh, a greater effect on teaching and learning, those are really, really tough questions. One of the things that I would like to, to just kind of uh, put out there is that one of the ways that you can actually drive that change is through lesson study through your kind of proactive choice of taking a different approach to teaching, to, to shaping student learning, uh, the experiences that you have and the way that you share those with people in your admin departments, people in your subject uh, departments, people in your grade levels, can really shape the way that we think about how we use time effectively. You know, we, we always could use more time, but one of the big questions is not just do we have time, but how are we using that time that we have? Denise, thanks a lot for that. Would anyone else like to respond to this question? How do these practices or ideas challenge your thinking or practice, or what questions do they raise for you? All right, we're going to. Oh, Mary, we are opening your microphone. If you'd like to unmute your microphone, please. There you go, there you go. go ahead, please. I just had a very quick question. Yes. I'm looking at developing visual learning aids to try to develop um, thinking in, in sciences. And some of the practices mentioned challenge the idea of creating a visual. So um, a visual that kind of develops from the key facts towards their application and then the implication of that learning outside of the classroom learning. So I would just be interested to hear from, from others whether or not the challenges that they perceived from looking at the information um, are reasonably, um, can be reasonably overcome in terms of the planning so far within a lesson study thinking. Does anyone would really like to respond to Mary's question or let us know if you've had similar questions. Again, I think that, that looking at things like visual learning to develop thinking in science or in any of the subject matters is a very interesting focus for a lesson study piece. And, and again, to, to think about how you understand the efficacy of doing that um, lesson study by virtue of the fact that you're going to be doing focal observations on specific students can give you a lot of information about what, uh, what the learning outcomes can be from that kind of approach. All right, Mary, thank you very much. We are going to move on to our second uh, paired discussion of the afternoon. And for this one, I would like you to refer to your responses in learning log 4.2. And what I would like you to do is, is, is think of those responses and consider these two questions. What student data will you use to inform your research lesson and how you use the data? What I would like you to do is to share that with the person who you're talking to. Um, and I would like the person who's listening first to ask you some additional questions about the data that you've selected, why you've selected it, and how you're going to use it and then flip roles and allow the other person to first explain and the other person to listen and then ask questions. I'm going to give you 10 minutes for this discussion, so that's about five minutes a person. We will let you know when there are two minutes remaining. And at the end of this paired discussion, we're actually going to do a round robin and allow everyone the opportunity to respond. You can certainly pass to the next person if you don't want to respond. Uh, but again, at the end of this lesson, or at the end of this discussion, we are going to do a kind of a round robin to see what you talked about. Again, you have 10 minutes. If you'd like to go ahead and 
link by Skype. We will let you know when there are two minutes remaining. Thank you. And again, type an asterisk into the chat box anytime if you have a question. Next slide. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I'm hoping that that was a good discussion. There were some people who did encounter some technical problems with Skype. And so even if you weren't able to share uh, what you uh, recorded in your learning log with other people, what I'm hoping is that you're going to be able to share that with us now. And as I mentioned before, we are going to use a round robin. Um, you can see the sequence of people I'm going to call on on the right, so you can see where you are in that lineup. And again, what I'd like you to briefly respond to is what student data will you use to inform your research lesson and how you use that data. So what's the data you're going to use and how are you going to use it and in terms of what you're thinking about right now. We are going to start with Stephanie. So Stephanie, we have unmuted your microphone if you want to unmute yourself. Okay. Yep, Stephanie, go ahead. Um, well, we had a chat and the assessment sort of methods that I'm going to use, I'm going to use my students' initial writing sample from September just to see what kind of writers they are based on that uh, data. And then I was going to do a small group interview on how students feel about writing um, from a cross-section of my student population. And then a student survey again, but with the whole class on um, their attitude towards writing before I start using any of the strategies to improve my delivery of writing lessons and increase student engagement and enjoyment of the writing process. Great, Stephanie, thank you very much for that. One of the things that I, that I meant to mention before people began responding is, if you as you listen to other people and you hear the kind of data that they are planning to use and how they're planning to use it, Think about how that might relate to your particular research question. And uh, again, please note the people who are responding. Everyone in the course, I know that we've had some people who have contacted one another between the sessions already to talk about some of the things that have come up through the course. And I hope, again, that you will see one another as resources. And if someone talks about a research method, like, for example, Stephanie talked about using small group interviews. If you've never used small group interviews with students, or even if you have and you want to find out more about how Stephanie plans to do that, please contact her and found out more. So kind of use this both as a way to kind of hear about what other people are doing as well as uh, begin to think about ways that you might connect with other people in the school to learn more about their practice. We're going to open Karen's microphone now. No, Karen's not there. Oh, Karen is not here. I'm sorry. Karen has stepped away for just a moment. So we are going to open Charlene's microphone. And Charlene, if you can unmute yourself. Charlene, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, the way I will be doing it is similar to Stephanie because we have the same uh, goal that we're looking at for the year to increase the students, improve the students' writing. Um, so first of all, I'll use the writing piece that was sent up to me from grade two. I'll be going through that. We'll probably be doing a little survey with the children and just interviewing them to find out why do they like or dislike writing and how can we improve it. Great, thank you. And, and again, for those of you who don't char know Charlene and Stephanie's question, they're looking at, at how you can actually improve not just writing, but improve students' enthusiasm for the writing process. So they're looking at both academic development and some non-cognitive outcomes in their research question. We're going to move on now to Kate. Kate, we are opening your microphone. Oh, Kate is Okay, Kate, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Hi. Sorry, Julia and I just trying to get ourselves. Okay. I think that's working now. It, it, we, Is that okay? You. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm looking at um, improving their guided inquiry skills. And so uh, to, to gather data to start with, because it's specifically focused on that, I, I would... Um, do a kind of self-contained single lesson guided inquiry learning followed by an assessment at the end that, so I could see not only how they're doing all the way through but how they have learned what they need to learn and apply at the end and um, and then do a similar thing, similar leveled kind of 
um, assessment after I've tried to <laughs> use some different instructional methods. So that would be the kind of data I would look at. Kate, that you've actually kind of glimpsed into what we're going to be talking about in, in next week's session by suggesting the use of a self-contained lesson to actually not only get some insight into the instructional method that you might use or the resources, but also as an opportunity to collect some baseline student data. So a, a really excellent strategy, and, and it really it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a, a fundamental uh, practice in lesson study is the use of uh, self-contained single lessons to gather that kind of information. So thank you very much for that. We're going to open up Amanda's microphone now. And I guess, again, Amanda, if you could unmute yourself. Uh, there it is. Okay, Amanda, if you could unmute your microphone. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I, I lost connection, so I've been sort of out for the last five minutes and I'm not sure what was communicated. We're, are we just, we're sharing our student data from our... Yes, yeah, so, so responding to these questions, you know, based on, on your thinking right now, what student data do you think you're going to use to inform your research lesson and how might you use that data? Great. Um, so I was looking at using um, some of the diagnostic uh, data that we do at the beginning of the year for reading comprehension and interpretation skills, uh, which are essentially uh, written uh, response, responses to questions that are embedded in text, and those, those texts are um, differentiated by level, but the, the questions are essentially the, you know, looking for the same skills. Um, also, speaking uh, anecdotal notes from a whole class and partner conversations uh, about text. And then um, formative assessment data from the turn and talks and stop and jots that um, I do with um, a shared text or read aloud. Great. And so then I use those different types of data mainly for forming the groups for the book clubs. Uh, so I, I try to form the first round of book clubs based on um, student uh, reading level and then um, and then also including students that have, uh, well, a, a mixed ability of um, conversation and um, interpretation skills, and then um, give them choice of the text within that group. Great. Amanda, thank you for that. And, and again, one of the things that we've heard Amanda, Amanda say that's similar to some of the other responses is the use of several different sources of data. In this case, um, Amanda talked about the use of anecdotal record and observations of student activities like turn and talk as, uh, as additional sources of data and information in order to plan the research lesson. Thank you very much. So we are going to go to Richard next. Richard, go ahead, please. I love it. Seriously? Hi, Richard. Hello. How do you start, Father? And Hi, Richard. Do you want to respond to the question? Uh, sorry, um, you're talking about the question, what student data will you use to inform your research lesson? Yes, please. Yeah, I was taken a bit by surprise by this one because I wasn't expecting it. Um, I'm just looking through here my, my responses. Um, Well, in short, I need to have um, data that will inform me about students' readiness and preparedness to, to do a self-study, um, reading or sometimes watching uh, videos in a purposeful way. The, the problem we have at the level that I teach at is that students tend to try and cut corners. So I, I need data on uh, how ready they are so I can then work towards making them ready. Great, thank you. Okay. All right, we are going to go to Denise next. Denise, we are unmuting your microphone, so if you would like to do the same, please. Go ahead, Denise. Um, in addition to the um, summative and diagnostic assessments, 
that I that I have, I guess, or that I do at the beginning of the year, because of the sim project that I've been doing, which is trying to gauge comfort level in the target language. Um, I do have a lot of data. Um, my my partner and I have a lot of data on how to in measuring what the students feel comfortable with, how how much are they liking the different activities that we provide to have them speak in the language they're learning. So there's a lot of formative, there's a checkout survey that they do after every class and there's a um, um, description of a picture that they do twice a quarter. So there is a lot of formative data in, that I can use already to try to group. So I'm hoping to plan lessons around this, even though in general we are planning lessons around what they find the most useful to learn the language and what they find um, maybe easiest or helps them prepare more. It, you know, to have this data in mind when you're actually pairing or you're putting students in groups uh, will certainly go a long way in terms of having them feel more comfortable when speaking, trying to make them um, go above expectation when it comes to bringing up on either using new new vocabulary or new grammar concepts. So the data is there. It's just a matter of sitting down and figuring out how do you want certain lessons to go. Do I pair them with, you know, having one that's going to challenge the other? Let's say we have two that in their um, comfort level surveys are saying that they feel uncomfortable doing certain things, but we want those skills to be developed, do we pair those type of students together? So I'm really looking forward to actually planning lessons based on that data uh, that keeps on coming in almost, um, yeah, it does keep on coming in on a weekly basis. Great, Denise, thank you for that. So again, one of the things that Denise has added to kind of this, this list of, of things is using this data to create paired groupings and using the data to think about are the groupings students with similar interests and similar abilities, or are the groupings students who have very different interests and different abilities? I, I should also mention that that data would, and, and, and those the, uh, the development of those groupings based on data will be very, very useful when you're trying to identify those students who you're gonna do the focal observations on during the actual delivery of the research lesson. All right, we're gonna to go to Mary next. Mary, we've opened your microphone and you are open, so please go ahead. Hi, um, the kind of data that I have available at the moment is data on scientific knowledge and understanding and practical investigation or data analysis. And the data that I'll need is a little bit before the investigation or analysis, but based on their understanding. So at the moment, students show me their understanding on quizzes or Star Trek activities and in tests, I'd like to see their understanding in the form of a visual map, which would prepare them for a practical activity based on all the relevant knowledge within the unit that they've learned so far. That data can then be translated into some kind of application that shows how they understand their work implies to different activities or industries or sectors of society outside of the school, so that I can see they understand their learning goes beyond the classroom. In addition to that, I used a lot of video material assignments where each video is followed by a quiz that gives me a direct mark for where their understanding is at. And I get this data quite nicely presented through applications that I use. So for lots, I've got lots of data for student understanding and would like to develop more so the way that uh, student understanding is presented so that it ties over nicely with practical work and further application. Great. Mary, thank you very much for that. And, and again, the, Mary's description of uh, a, a way or an idea of using a performance task to show scientific knowledge and understanding is again creating that more rounded data set, that whole idea of triangulating, collecting data from a range of different perspectives about the same thing. So she already has test and quiz information uh, uh, that relates to scientific knowledge and understanding to kind of combine that with a performance task, like the development of a visual map uh, gives her additional depth of information about the same topic. So thank you, Mary. We are going to go to Julia now. Julia, if you can unmute, unmute your microphone, please go ahead, Julia. Um, so I'm trying to look at collaboration when students are doing practical work. 
and I'm going to get some baseline data because Kate's going to come and observe some, so in sort of doing it in practice as well as talking about it, Kate's going to come and observe some lessons this week to see uh, as students are making a results table how that happens in a group, whether people end up with different tables, whether um, one person dominates the group, or um, so trying to look at the interactions in the groups and we're trying to see if some groups are more functional than others and work out why that might be the case and then from then lead, in, lead into some interventions. So I'm not quite sure what the interventions would be yet, so what would therefore be the research lesson where the interventions would take place. That's as far as we got. Great. And, and, and again, that's very similar to something that we've heard earlier, actually using an observation of a lesson to inform the development of the research lesson and then the subsequent observations you would do there. So that is a, is a really great way to think about planning a lesson study, especially a lesson study where you may not have a lot of readily available data that relates to the topic that you're trying to measure. I want to thank everyone for those really thoughtful um, responses and your early ideas of how you might use data, or what data you might use, and how you might use it in your lesson study. And I just want to ask right now if there's anything else that anyone would like to add to that discussion. Maybe you heard someone say something and it kind of gave you another idea. If you'd like to add anything to the discussion right now, just type an asterisk into the box and we will open your microphone. All right, no one appears to have any other questions or comments right now. So as we get ready to close the session, can I just remind you that you do have a learning log 4.3. And again, this is a place where as an option, you can record your learning points from the different sessions. Again, this is completely an optional activity. Some people find this useful. Um, as with the other sessions, if you will watch for the session five materials in tomorrow's mail, and you will also get a link to go to the recording of this session. And in the coming days, you will then receive an invitation to join the GoToMeeting for session five. So again, watch for the session five materials, watch for the invitation to join next week. Thank you all very much for joining this afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you next week. In between sessions, if you have any questions, please do send us an email. We are happy to talk about lesson study in between the sessions. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks.